we're going to talk about going beyond your limitations and living a courageously creative life, something I know you guys are all passionate about as um, creative mornings people. But before we talk about this, I, um, I want to kind of open an imaginary door and invite you into my office. So this is my office, um, which I've affectionately dubbed the Peach Pit on account of the peach-colored walls, the cozy womb-like interior, and the fact that I'm a child of the 90s who love 90210. <laughs> and about once a week, I have people come to the Peach Pit and brainstorm. And anyone in the company can sign up. It doesn't matter what level you're at or what department you're in. Um, you can come into the Peach Pit. And in there, we hatch new ideas. We help each other solve problems. And we connect IRL. And we also eat peach-colored candies and drink rosé sometimes. A key element of the Peach Pit is this buzzer, um, which I have lovingly bedazzled. And this is our sort of no limits buzzer. And when you mention budget, eh, you get buzzed. If you mention, oh, I don't think that's going to drive traffic, eh, you get buzzed. And that's not because those things aren't realities that we need to take into consideration when we're coming up with ideas. But in this room, we want there to be nothing that's impossible. We want to let creativity thrive, and we want everyone to feel comfortable to bring their ideas to the table. And I start every Peach Pit out the same way, and I'm going to ask that you guys join me in doing this. So what I need you to do is, if you're able to stand up, please stand up. Try and um, have, I know it's a cramped room, but try and have like a little bit of room between you and your neighbor. I don't want any injuries on my watch. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you have to limit your movements for safety's sake, that's OK. Um, so what we're going to do is an improv warm up. And um, we're going to start with the right leg and shake it four, three, two, one times. You don't have to do it yet. If you want to practice, that's fine, too. Um, so we go right, right leg, right arm, left leg, left arm, counting down. Four, three, two, one. Then three, two, one, two, one, one, one. And um, you want to just like project your voice through, like almost as though it's going through that limb as you do it. And um, don't worry if you mess up, if it's like hard to follow along. I almost always mess it up, too. So it's just about getting the yayas out. So it's all cool. OK, are you guys ready? OK. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. 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 Two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, 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 one. <laughs> Amazing. How do you guys feel? You can sit down. Um, <laughs> so did you feel your energy shift? So why do we shake it out in the peach pit? We shake it out because play creates trust. We shake it out because it gets us out of our heads and into our bodies. And we shake it out because it levels the playing field. I'm just as ridiculous as you are. You're just as ridiculous as I am. So we can just leave those inhibitions at the door. <laughs> and I brought you into the Peach Pit to start the morning because it really embodies for me three of the core tenets of courageous creativity. The first, be the most you. When you bring your unique personality and strengths to the table, you can turn a boring brainstorm into a peach pit. The second, create the conditions for creativity. Creativity can be so elusive, so it's important to develop the conditions to nurture it in yourself and in others. And three, friction creates sparks. When you have different people in the room with different opinions, different backgrounds, it, really interesting creative things can happen. So we've shaken it out together, so I figure it's only appropriate that I introduce myself. Hey, guys. I'm Piera. And I grew up in a small town in Maine. This is the town square of Cape Porpoise. Um, very bumpin' Friday night, as you can imagine. <laughs> and I grew up um, with amazing parents. Uh, my dad is an entrepreneur. And we would grow up doing business brainstorms around the kitchen table. 
And my mom is a fierce feminist and social worker, and she would read us feminist fairy tales at night. As you can see, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. This is my brother and I. We're both um, entrepreneurs, feminists, and fierce lovers of life like our parents, and we love a good costume. As a teenager, I got a subscription to Sassy Magazine, and I was obsessed. It was my window into this incredible world of New York with badass girl gang making content that showed, showed me that weird is cool, and I just was obsessed. Um, I knew that I had to move to New York in that moment. And this was my girl gang when I was in high school. Um, this was my favorite outfit, blue wig, blue sequin dress, white go-go boots. I would still wear that today. <laughs> And so when I graduated high school, I moved to New York and went to art school. And I was so happy. I knew I had really made the right choice. I was so moved to be in this beautiful city, surrounded by people from all different cultures, and to be immersed in such rich culture of the arts. Um, and I just ate up everything that I could. I was like, had this voracious appetite for the culture of New York, especially coming from that tiny town. And it was the culture of New York that originally inspired the idea for Refinery29, which I started with uh, my co-founders, Philip, Justin, and Christine. And this was the original Refinery29. It started with just a tiny idea, which was to celebrate the independent makers of New York City, the people that were bringing together really unique and diverse communities and celebrating personal style. And this was um, a map that had 29 different stores that were sort of the best of the best of New York City. And when we started Refinery29, the women's media landscape looked something like this. A lot of articles about how to please your man, how to get beach body ready, you know, how to drop that ab weight, really selling this sort of damaging aspiration to women and something that I just didn't identify with at all. Um, this really narrow lens on what beauty looked like and what it was to, that women should aspire to. And we wanted to create content for a new generation of women. You know, I was raised to aspire to be you know, the most badass version of myself, to continue to grow and evolve and be curious and really you know, live a big, full life. And so that was, that was what we wanted to create for our audience. And I'm going to show you a video that gives you a sense of the women that we create for and the content that we're making for them. Feels a little bit stronger up here, kind of a like a head crosswind. It's a little bit gusty, so maybe I'll be able to get a lull so we can get this off. There's a, a bit of a crosswind over here. If it's windy where you're at, obviously you don't need to jump. Definitely your call. So that's what I'm talking about. That is the, um, the women that we're creating content for and the message that we're putting out there for women to feel, see, and claim their power. And sometimes you, know, you have this vision of yourself and this idea of who you are. And there are times when that gets challenged. And because sometimes being the most you isn't about necessarily that you are one fixed thing. You know, we all evolve and grow in our lives. 
And I had this moment that was um, really uncomfortable for me as we were growing our business. I felt very comfortable in the role of creative director and you know, someone that was coming up with a lot of ideas for the company and overseeing you know, the way that those ideas came to life. But I also had to inhabit this role as executive. And I started to have to do a lot of things that were really foreign to me that I, you know, in my mind, I was like, I don't have any experience that has taught me how to do these things. So I started to have to you know, manage a big team. I started to have to negotiate. I started to have to really think about business strategy in a whole new way. And I felt just, I had this kind of out of body experience. I remember I would be sitting in these big executive meetings and I would be looking around and I just felt like an alien. I felt like I was a kid at the adults table. And I, I got so uncomfortable that I actually questioned if I was still the right person for the company. But, you know, identity is something that can shift, and I started to think about, okay, how can I take what makes me me and the things that are my strengths that I do, you know, well and with little effort, and bring those into the things that are really uncomfortable? And, you know, because what I learned is that if something doesn't fit you, you can tailor it to fit you better. So the, the time that really kind of opened my eyes up to this was when I learned to negotiate in my own style. And before this point, I thought that negotiation went something like this. Pick up the phone. Fuck you. It's my way or the highway. Hang up the phone. <laughs> Of course, that's an exaggeration. I know, I know. But you know, I just thought you had to be so uncompromising and really just so demanding, and it felt completely not like my style. But I said, what if I, you know, let me try this in my own way. And so I started to negotiate in this way that brought to, you know, brought to the table my skills of imagination and vision. And so I would start a negotiation by really painting a very clear picture of the thing that I wanted to create with the other person. And I would you know, really flesh that out until the other person was like nodding their head and saying like, yeah, I want to do that too. That sounds so cool. And then I would use my power of listening and collaboration and just be transparent and say, OK, well, um, I need x and you have y. And let's talk about, you know, how we can get to a better place. And I would just really listen. I would take my time. And then I would use my creativity to come up with solutions that fit what the other person had said and what I knew I needed. And this amazing thing happened. I started to do better than the goals that were set for me and the goals that I had set for myself. And most importantly, I just felt so much more comfortable in my own skin. I felt so much more comfortable in my ability. And I realized that I didn't have to check myself at the door to move into these new areas, that I could use my strengths to flourish in these zones that were so unfamiliar to me. So it was like a safety blanket coming along the ride for me. So being the most you is really all about staying true to your values, knowing what it is that's non-negotiable for you, and trying to bring that into all that you do in your life and your career. Trusting your intuition. You know, I, I truly believe that your gut will guide you. If it doesn't fit, tailor it to fit you better. You can use your strengths to flourish in the areas that are new and uncomfortable to you and make them your own. And remember that you're never done growing. Being the most you is not about a fixed state of being. It's about growing and developing and staying true to yourself along the way. A few months ago, one of our creative directors came into my office. And she wanted to brainstorm about a project. So she briefed me. And we sat down together, and I just started coming up with all these ideas. I was just shooting them off. I was on fire. We could do this. We could do that. Um, really having fun with it. And I looked at her face. I thought she was going to be elated because I was being so helpful. <laughs> and uh, she looked completely downtrodden. And I said, Stella, what's going on? Is everything OK? And she sighed, and she said, you have all these ideas, and that's amazing. But when I had to brainstorm a couple hours ago, I didn't have anything. 
And sometimes I wonder if I'm creative enough for this job. I felt for her in that moment, oh my god. You know, who here hasn't had a moment like that where you um, fall short, then you start to doubt your own abilities, and you kind of spiral down this rabbit hole of like self-doubt and self-flagellation? I know I've been there a million times. So I said to her, I said, Stella, tell me, what were the conditions for your brainstorm? What was going on when you had to come up with these ideas? And she said, oh, well, um, our West Coast salesperson called me up, and she said, I need these ideas by the end of the day um, for our client. Like, what do you got? I was like, okay. So someone put a gun to your head, said, dance, monkey, dance, and you ran out of dance moves. Really not a big surprise. I said, Stella, I've learned that when I need to come up with ideas, especially if it's in a pinch, I need to create the conditions for creativity. And those conditions for me mean surrounding myself with imagery that sparks ideas. It means you know, opening up a magazine or going on a thesaurus and popcorning like with word association. And most often, it means bringing people into my office who I trust and feel comfortable with that help me to get out of my own head and, and be creative. And I said to her, I said, Stella, you are routinely one of those people. I always pull you in here when I need to come up with ideas. So it's really no wonder that I'm here you know, with all these ideas shooting out of my brain. And when you had your conditions for your brainstorm, you were stuck. And I think that's so important to remember. So often we can get fixated on that moment of deficit where we just fell short. And what if instead, we follow the breadcrumb trail back on the moments when your head was exploding with ideas. And you think about what was going on that led me to that place. Because that's what's really powerful. Because the conditions for creativity are truly different for everyone. So you need to find out what, what those are for you. And then you can fall back on them again and again and again. I learned about the conditions for creativity Early in my career, um, in my first job other than babysitting, um, I worked at a small magazine called City, and we would have these amazing brainstorms um, where everyone felt really comfortable, so it would kind of go something like this. I would always see this pattern. We would be really ridiculous. Someone would say something like so off the wall and so absurd, and then everyone would crack up laughing, and then boom, brilliance. Time and time and time again. And this is the kind of thing that we would be brainstorming. This was a shoot that we did, um, balloon people modeling the season's hottest fashion accessories. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it would be like, Big Papa, latex lovers, like just all these crazy ideas f like flying out. And then someone would shout out, inflated egos. And we would know that was the one. And I think anyone that was looking at this brainstorm that we were doing would have thought that we were just fucking around. Like we, you know, it looked, probably looked ridiculous. Um, but in actuality, we were being extremely productive. So um, I think laughter unlocks like a higher level of brilliance and it's really fun, so I highly encourage it. That said, you know, the conditions for creativity aren't always sunny. A day that was really dark for me and for many people was the day after the election. I felt crushed. I um, wanted to put on black and crawl into a hole. I definitely didn't want to go to work. But a place that I derive a lot of courage from um, in my life is my role as a leader. And I knew that that was a day that I couldn't crawl into a hole. I needed to pull myself together and go in and be there for my team. So I put on my pink power suit. And I went into the office and I said, you know what, I'm going to work with the energy here today and we're going to turn pain into purpose. We're going to find a way through. And so we did a creative healing session. I know it sounds really hippy-dippy, and it was, and it was great. Um, <laughs> and we talked about you know, what we were feeling. We you know, did a writing exercise. And then we sort of we did um, a vocal exercise. And then we said, you know what, let's talk about how we can be there for our audience, and what we can do to move forward. And it was a really amazing brainstorm. So many incredible ideas um, came from it that we ended up um, you know, following through with. And it was really healing for everyone there. 
And one of the projects that came out of it was um, our work with the Women's March. And so we worked with over 30 artists to create artwork that was um, available for our audience to post on their social, to download as signs. And um, the work just went viral. We saw um, so many different people posting it. Hillary Clinton tweeted one of our illustrations. It was really amazing. We saw people marching with these signs from New York City to um, Park City to Paris to Kosovo. And we were even on the cover of the New York Times um, with one of our illustrations. And I think this was an incredible moment um, and an incredible realization, which is that sometimes when you walk into the uncomfortable with courage, when you have the courage to face emotion head on and to translate pain into power, you can really tap into something much deeper and much wider than yourself. You can tap into the zeitgeist. So, Create the conditions for creativity. It's really all about knowing what works for you, following that breadcrumb trail back so that you can recreate those conditions for yourself when you're stuck. Laughter unlocks brilliance. You know, it's not a waste of time. It's fun and productive. Doing it for someone else. Sometimes when you can you know, think about the person that you're creating the work for or the person that you want to show up for, it really helps you to bolster your courage. And embrace the uncomfortable. You know, I think it's our human nature to try to want to like run the other way when we're faced with an uncomfortable situation. Um, but if you can walk into it with courage, um, you can really make an impact. Friction creates sparks. Who's feeling sparky? <laughs> Another moment that was um, really uncomfortable for me as we grew our business was this moment where um, we were really ramping up our content production. And um, I was hearing from a lot of people in the company that creative was a bottleneck. And um, because they wanted to move really quickly, get all these stories up, and they felt that the creative process was slowing them down. And so they started kind of going around the creative process and pulling um, a lot of imagery from stock websites. This was a few years ago, and, and the stock landscape was um, really not representative of what we stand for as a brand. There was not the diversity, the creativity, um, the inclusivity that we wanted to represent in all of our imagery. We wanted to reflect our audience and our content, and all of a sudden, our site was not doing that. And I was so frustrated. I was talking to a friend and just like bitching about this. And I was like, I was like, they're doing this and we need to control the brand. We need to keep the brand tight. And, and she said, whoa, 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 whoa. She was like, calm down. First of all, just like chill out. It's just you and me. And she was like, isn't it interesting how they're saying that creative is a bottleneck. And then every time you talk about it, you make this like throttling motion with your hands. <laughs> I know, fist palm. Uh, so I was like, oh my god, wow, you're so observant. And yeah, that's, that's a good point. So I started to think about um, how, can, how can I rephrase this in a way um, that will help me to get my power back in this situation will also, you know, so I thought, OK, what if instead of this tight motion, we think about it as guardrails on the highway so that we can tell people they can drive as fast as they want, but we just don't want them to you know, drive off the road and crash a car. And so I started talking about it in that way and really reframing the way that I was talking to my collaborators within the company. And it, it changed the way they were thinking about it. And most importantly, it changed the way I was thinking about it. So I started to think about, um, instead of trying to control things, I started to think about how can I create guardrails, how can I create tools so that people have more autonomy, can move quickly, but are staying within um, you know, the parameters of our brand. And so one of the things that we did is we created our own stock imagery. Um, we sa I said, you know what, if it doesn't exist, we can build it. And so we created stock imagery that represented our audience um, that showed you know, women being empowered, living a full, beautiful life that was colorful, creative, and vibrant. And it was amazing. It really has been one of the things that has allowed us to scale and grow. And our visual identity is now such a hugely differentiated part of our site that draws in clients and audience. And 75% of our audience say that they can recognize a Refinery29 image in a lineup. 
And we took this to a larger scale this past year um, when we partnered with Getty to create a collection. We said, why, why should we change representation of women only on our own site when we can actually take that to the world and, and say to the industry, you know what, we're going to give you the tools to better represent women too. So we created this No Apologies collection because we know that you know, women should not have to apologize for who they are or what they look like. So friction creates sparks. It's really all about combating frustration with imagination, reframing the problem to unlock the solution. So sometimes if you just change the way you're talking about it or change the image that you have in your mind, it can really help you get unstuck. And you can do it. I've told myself so many times, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I, I gotta quit. And you know what, I've done it, I'm up here doing it, and you can do it too. So who wants to do something dorky with me? Everybody? Yes? Okay, I'm gonna say you can do it, and you're gonna say I can do it. You can do it. I can do it. You can do it. I can do it. You can do it. I can do it. Damn straight. <laughs> I started you guys off in the peach pit, and now I'm going to take you out in one of my other favorite spaces that I created. It's called 29 Rooms. And 29 Rooms is our interactive fun house of style, culture, and technology, and one of my favorite places. And 29 Rooms really embodies the three tenets of courageous creativity for me. So, we started, this, we started to create this event um, to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. And we said to ourselves, we want to take our digitally native brand and create a live experience that really brings our audience into our world in a unique way. So we started brainstorming by being the most us. We said, what are the unique attributes of our brand? What are our strengths? What are we known for? Um, so we started talking about you know, inclusivity, diversity, creativity, imagination. And we also thought about our history. And we went all the way back to that mall map that I showed you at the beginning. And we said, what if we turn that into a reality where we created 29 unique spaces that brought our content and our mission to life? And we love this idea. We said, we'll call it 29 rooms. And we started you know, pulling all this amazing imagery from um, museums and, and installation artists to inspire the way that we wanted it to look and feel. And we were so excited. So our next step was to bring it to the executive team and pitch it. And as you can imagine, it, well, they were, they were very excited. They were like, it looks really cool. But then friction. Eh, the buzzer was going off. Um, so they said, well, you know, it looks really beautiful, but it looks like MoMA. How are we going to get that kind of artistic credibility? It said, they said, it looks cool, but it looks really goddamn expensive. <laughs> how are we going to get, you know, how are we going to monetize this event? And they said, it looks really cool, but it looks huge, and how are, you know, we're a digitally native brand, how are we going to entice people to come out, you know, during New York Fashion Week to our event over all the other events? And then it got really gnarly, and someone said, mm, I think we should just have a cocktail party. <laughs> oh. And like a lot of people in the room were agreeing. It hurt. But at this point, I know friction creates sparks, so I said, great feedback. We'll come back to you. <laughs> and so we took that feedback, and we said, OK, monetization. We are going to um, work with amazing brands to bring their brand to life in some of these rooms. And we're going to sell it um, and really make an authentic and amazing experience. So we worked with Ford. We worked with Disney. We worked with Michael Kors. And a host of other awesome brands. We said, OK, artistic credibility. Well, our brand has always been about celebrating the independent spirit and celebrating independent makers. So we are going to work with 29 different visionaries to bring these rooms to life. And we worked with Solange. We worked with RuPaul. We worked with Nicola Formichetti and many, many others to turn these rooms into you know, this incredible experience. 
And we worked with these artists who had really unique, diverse communities, the same way that our original map did. And they brought their own audiences in. And we said, OK, getting people there, well, we're going to turn this into the most beautiful Instagram playground. And social media is going to be the way that we draw the crowds. And we had lines around the block both years. We got 10,000 people through the experience. We reached one in two people on Instagram. But the thing that was the most rewarding to me was the fact that we created the conditions for creativity, not just for ourselves, but for our audience. People came through the event and said things like, this event made me feel creative, or after going through 29 rooms, I realized it was time for me to start dreaming bigger. It was so moving. And that's the thing about courageous creativity. When you are courageously creative, it creates more courageous creativity in the world. Courageous creativity is contagious. So you guys are courageous. You are creative. You can go beyond your limitations. You can go beyond your expectations. Now go do it. <laughs>